Welcome back to the show. It's always incredible to see Preston Pish, entrepreneur, investor, podcast host, and he just made an exciting announcement joining Ego Death Capital as GP. They just raised $100 million. That's Jeff Booth's fund, if you're not familiar with it. Congratulations, Preston. It's so great to see Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. Yeah, it's wonderful to be here. Um, big fan of your show and what you're doing. So yeah, thank you so much for the invite. Well, likewise, grateful to call you a friend. I've admired your work for a long time. So update us on this GP position and role at yeah. Ego Death. Yeah. So I think for people that, uh, you know, see the announcement, they might not be intimately familiar with what we're trying to accomplish. So uh, the first fund at Ego Death was focused on seed investments and just really trying to make the, uh, the layer two percolate and, and kind of grow. Um, when you look at this past cycle, just four years ago, Lightning was extremely new, fresh. Businesses were just being created for the very first time on layer two. Um, and so when you think about uh, allocating capital into that space, um, you've got to scale. I, I think you got to scale it properly and uh, not really raise too much because there's there's going to be a bunch of small startup things. You don't know what's going to be successful as far as, far as probabilities go um, as that as the, the technology matures in that space. Um, so now as we're getting ready to go into the next cycle, we're looking at some of those, some of those companies that are really showing promise. Um, they've, they've got a proven concept. They have initial traction. They have a developed business model. They have experienced, uh, management team. They have market potential. Um, they have somewhat of a competitive moat. And when you're looking at going into a series A uh, investment, these are the characteristics that you really need to have in order to make a series A investment, because these are these are larger investments, which is why we're raising the amount that, that we're raising for fund uh, for fund two, because it's really focusing on series A investments. Um, and so we think that the, the, the tech maturation that, that we're at in layer two on Bitcoin specifically, and I can get into why we have a, a Bitcoin specific, I think everybody listening to your show probably knows, but I'll, I'll say it anyway. But uh, for the second fund, we think that the Series A is, is the right timing for the, the, the tech backdrop that, that we're investing into. So we think, and this is a foot stomp uh, moment, right? We think security and decentralization has to be the bedrock protocol that it has to be optimized for that and for people that maybe aren't intimately familiar with uh this trilemma you can really only optimize for uh scalability you can optimize for security or you can optimize for decentralization you can only pick two of those three bitcoin is optimized for the uh security and the decentralization. And it has pushed scalability into the second and third layers of, of the protocol. Um, we think that that is vital. We think that anybody that's building on something that hasn't optimized for security and decentralization is building on a foundation that is not solid and it's not bedrock. Um, there's people calling uh, Bitcoin a pet rock. Uh, Kenny Florian had an amazing tweet yesterday. He says, it's not a pet rock, it's bedrock. And that really right. goes to the core thesis of, of what we're trying to accomplish at ego death. So, you know, if, if that, if that mission, uh, if you, if you're empathetic to that mission, you know, check out the website and, uh, we'd love to, to chat with you on, on that. So yeah, well, you're, I'm ex you're very excited. We're excited for you. You're doing incredible work and it is such a positive mission. And I love what Jeff Booth always says. It's like, focus on the world you want to see and and build yes. that. Don't focus on all the bad things going on, even though we will talk about some of, the, some of those <laughs> there's, things. There's so much to talk about there that it can be very distracting. And and for some of us, it is entertaining, which uh, can, can be distracting because it's so entertaining and it's just so in contrast to like what we're trying to do. It's really hard to to ignore at times, but you're exactly right. And Jeff is exactly right. You need to focus on the building. Well, uh, you mentioned one of the topics I wanted to discuss with you, Bitcoin being called a pet rock by none other than <laughs> Jamie Dimon. And by the way, JP Morgan is one of the authorized participants in these new spot Bitcoin ETFs. So let's get your thoughts on some of the, the recent headlines. You obviously tweeted some reactions to what Jamie Dimon said over in Davos he called Bitcoin a pet rock, said it's pretty much only for money laundering and illicit activity. Um, give us your thoughts on on what he's saying. 
Well, I th- let me let me zoom out even further than Jamie and just say Davos in general. Um, I think that there's this year you are noticing a very uh, different uh, messaging, or that you can tell that there's just something very different this year than previous years. So, what do I mean by that? So, for the first thing, Andrew Sorkin. He goes there on behalf of CNBC. Uh, they they set up their thing with all the snow backdrop every single year. So this year, as he's going to Davos the very first day, this is the tweet. This is this is exactly what he said in the tweet. I'm heading to Davos. I know, I know. Before you say it's a cabal, uh, a global cabal seeking profits for the elite, let me say this: Is everyone there self interested? Yes, emphatically, yes. But, and then he goes on to to say why he's going. He is justifying why he's there to his audience because he knows he's going to take so much flack for just going. This is, in my opinion, this is such a foot stomp. This used to be a massive flex for this entire, you know, financial media. Oh, I'm going to Davos. Look at me. I'm, I'm walking around in this you know, plus jacket with fur all over the place. And like, (laughs) like it it really was, it was a massive flex. And now you have these same people preemptively tweeting. Yes, this is a global cabal that only seeks profits for themselves. Are they self-interested? Yes. Emphatically. Yes. Like that's kind of crazy. That's, that's a massive shift in what we've ever seen historically. And I think it's a foot stomp. Uh, The other thing that I would say is, in the past, at least the last, call it five years, it's been this, this like constant beating of the drum of the great reset. We are in control. We are going to usher in this great reset, right? What, what is the theme that we're hearing this time around in Davos? Regaining trust, right? Regaining trust is like the, one of the, the narratives that's being propagated here. Um, Let's focus in on the word trust, right? Regaining trust. They require, this legacy system requires a thing called trust. And if there's one thing that anybody that's studied Bitcoin can understand, what does does Bitcoin bring? It brings a new monetary system that does not require trust. I can send, you can give me an address from anywhere on the planet. I don't even have to know who you are. And you can transmit a billion dollars worth of buying power to that address without anybody's permission at all. I don't have to trust you. I don't have to trust anybody in between. And that is what these people are up against with their antics as they're sitting around and, and singing Kumbaya with all their great speakers and everybody coming on stage. And, and their message is, We need to regain trust because we require trust Mm -hmm. to do what we're doing. And I think that that is just, you really have to be dialed in and kind of looking at a, uh, like, I guess, really excruciating detail of like the words that are being used and like, then what's behind these words and then compare it and contrast it to what, uh, all these brilliant cryptographers have been building for more than a decade. Um, on Jamie Dimon. Finally, I'm, I'm getting to your question here now. Coin Stories is brought to you by BitDeer, where the power of Bitcoin mining is at your fingertips. As a publicly traded leader, BitDeer's global reach and scale means they're everywhere you need them to be, ensuring you're part of the thriving Bitcoin economy. BitDeer's not just mining, they are industry pioneers, and BitDeer stands alone as the only vertically integrated, technology-focused Bitcoin mining company. What does that mean? Well, they're not just deploying, but developing the latest tech to make Bitcoin mining more efficient and effective. With the industry's most experienced leadership team, innovation is in their DNA, and it shows with a quarter of their workforce dedicated to research and development, pushing the boundaries of what's possible in Bitcoin mining. And now they're leveraging years of expertise in data center and cloud management into high-performance computing through a recently announced partnership with NVIDIA. Join BitDeer in reshaping the world of Bitcoin mining. Learn more at bitdeer.com and explore how they are pioneering the future today. 
No, this is great. <laughs> Sorry. This is great. No, I love I love all of this because to your point, it's the trustless network of Bitcoin being the only system you can trust going, yes. going forward. But keep going on, Jamie. So so what what did I hear when Jamie was talking? There was there was plenty of like hilarious material that came out of some of his comments. But the the most profound thing that that I captured from when uh, Jamie was talking was this this quote. Please stop talking about this shit in reference to Bitcoin. Yeah. Okay. He does not want this in your brain. He does not want this to be even talked about. He um, he then said, "This is the last time I'm extending my opinion on this." Meaning, I don't even want to come back here and sit with you guys and talk to you if you're going to ask me this question about this thing. He, it was almost like Voldemort, where mm -hmm. he he didn't even want to say the word Bitcoin. He said that thing that they you know call Bitcoin, <laughs> right? It's that toxic to his essence of who he is and what he represents. And let me tell you, folks, that is a very big deal. It is a very big deal that this that this person who's basically the the kingpin of legacy finance can't even bring himself to mutter the words Bitcoin. That's a really it's a big deal. It's a really big deal. And I guess my final point would be who did Jeffrey Epstein bank with? Exactly. Was it Bitcoin or was it JP Morgan? Exactly. Right? <laughs> like it's all there. It's easy to to see if and one one final thing, and sorry to kind of beat the the dead horse on this. Go into the comments on anything that's Davos related. I mean, it's it's mind blowing. Mm -hmm. Like they're posting their videos of of all these people talking at their events. Go to YouTube. Like go into the comments and see why they're saying they've got to regain trust. It's because every single comment in there is bashing them with a sledgehammer as to being out of touch with reality. And uh, I just, I think it's a, it's a major turning uh, point and something that is extremely notable uh, compared to previous years, this, this particular year. Well, we have to hand it to Joe Kiernan because when Jamie Dimon said all of that, he said that Bitcoin meets these six properties that make good money. And he said that it's US dollars that are primarily used for things like money yes. laundering. So Joe's a, Joe's a total Bitcoiner and I'm I'm all he about is. it. Um, and to your point about some of the earlier um, comments that were made during this uh, gathering of the, the world's finest minds, did you hear them talking about this idea that they're gonna track all of your carbon footprint, but they're trying to sell it as this really exciting innovation <laughs> that you're gonna know exactly your carbon footprint because yeah. they're gonna track where you travel, what you eat, everything you do. But then we had Javier Malay, who I know people are a little bit like iffy on. Is he, is he mm -hmm. pro Bitcoin? Is he going to do what he, he, he promised? But he went up there and he's like, the state does not solve problems. They create problems essentially, but it, mm -hmm. it needs to go back to the private sector and the power needs to be with us. We're the protagonists. So any thoughts on those updates? I'm, I'm shocked that they let him on stage. They, he, there's no way he could have shared his speech before going on the stage. Like <laughs> when, when I look at Davos, if I was going to generalize, uh, the, the people that are attending, right. They are, they, they control the world right now. They own all of the assets and, um, they control the purse strings of, of more fiat flowing into the system and where that will hopefully be directed once it gets into the system, which is into the hands of, of all the equity that they control. And, and I'm not here to say that I, I think that people that are wealthy and rich are bad and the poor are, are the best. And I'm not saying any of that, but what these people truly seek. People might think that they're after control and they are, but what they're, what they're really truly after is order. They seek order. They like the way that the world is, is currently structured. They don't want that to change. They don't want their equity to be repriced into some other type of monetary unit. That's the last thing that they want because that creates disorder for them. Okay. And so how do you how do you ensure that things remain orderly you seek control i think the control is after the desire for order and people might think that this is uh you know not important but 
I guess what I'm trying to do is remove, uh, remove the veil of evil that's, that's maybe a, a, a associated with this event. And I'm more trying to frame it as a, uh, helping people understand their incentive structure. Yes. Their, their incentives is that they, they want to remain powerful and in control. And you know what, if you had tons of power and control, not the control, but if you had tons of, of buying power, you would want to retain that the order of that system. And so their reaction and the way that they're moving is understandable. I'm not saying it's justified, but I'm saying that if we're looking at it objectively, Mm -hmm. that it makes sense that this is how they would be reacting to it. And mm -hmm. when you understand that and you can look at it objectively, you can then understand how you need to navigate through such a transition as they're battling to retain order. And what I think is going to, and maybe this is the optimist in me, I would like to think that as some of these people actually figure out how this transition's about to take place, that they will find and seek refuge in the thing that's going to bring about new order and control. Oh, control isn't the right word, but new order to the universe or the, or the world as to how things are going to be fairly built so that everybody on the planet has an equal opportunity. And it's not just being shoved into the, the people that controlled the printing press out of this legacy system. So, the, the reason I bring this up is there's so much negativity when you log into Twitter or any type of social media and it's, it's us versus them. And what I would like to really try to push into this next cycle is this idea that um, it doesn't have to be us versus them. We can sit here and constructively build this new system. And as people from the legacy system see how powerful and, and the value proposition that is being presented with this new system that we're building. Some of them, not all of them, some of them are going to, uh, and this goes to the saying, join us. Mm -hmm. And as we've learned, and as the saying goes, Bitcoin is for everybody, even your enemies. And if you, mm -hmm. if you view these people as your enemies, well, then that's, that's on you to, to view the world as, as that yep. binary, right? But I, what I think is important is some of them are going to join us. Some of them are going to opt into this new system that, that brings so much more promise in a trustless kind of way that reorganizes equity in a way that it's properly priced and not grossly overpriced at PEs of 35 that yield practically nothing for anybody that owns it. And it's going to be just, uh, you're going to get this great reset right? <laughs> but it's going to be in a way that's, that's more fair for everybody on the planet participating in the system. And who can't like that? Mm -hmm. Like, I am so here for this. I love that you framed it that way. I think it's such a more constructive um, point of view because just, just looking at it as us versus them and there's this evil cabal running the world, I, I don't think that that um, brings about any type of hope that we're able to change anything when we do have mm -hmm. the numbers and the power. And to your earlier point that all the people that are in Switzerland right now are uh, motivated by self-interest, well, we are, are. We all are. That's kind of the basis of capitalism. That's not a bad thing. But the problem is when you have a unit of account that can be so manipulated at the yes. core of the whole system, which exactly. allows for these incentive structures to basically pool capital in a very, very small group. And then they ex essentially have all the power and maybe they want order, but all they do is create chaos, right? So yes. this brings about the potential to even out the playing field and offer no one a special advantage just because they're, you know, in a certain position of society, everyone's going to have to play by the same rules. And I love that. That gives me a lot of hope as well. Um, I want to turn the focus a little bit to just the spot Bitcoin ETF, since that is one of the, mm -hmm. the biggest pieces of news that happened at the start of the year. Uh, your reaction, I mean, all these billions of dollars appear to be flowing in. BlackRock seems to be winning the liquidity race so far, but yet Bitcoin's price took a big hit. So what's going yeah. on? Well, I think there's there's been a lot of people talking about the GBTC sell pressure that's occurred. Um, I think that something that was missed uh, by many uh, leading into the the actual approval is that all these ETFs had to have seeded uh, Bitcoin in their treasury before they went live. And so that buying took place prior to the approval. And then after the approval, 
um, people that were buying the paper that represented the Bitcoin that was already in those treasuries that were already purchased on the spot market. Um, and as, as everybody knows, the price was kind of running leading up to this event. Well, you know, there was, there's some of the rationale as to maybe why it was running <laughs> leading up to the approval, but then post approval, uh, GBTC, I mean, people that had IRA accounts and they owned Bitcoin in their IRA account, pretty much the only way they could do it was MicroStrategy or uh, GBTC. Uh, after experiencing a massive discount in the assets under management in, inside the GBTC vehicle for, I don't know, a year and a half, um, I think they're, and they didn't adjust the 1.5% fee relative yeah. to all the other ETFs that were being offered at call it 20 basis points. Yep. People were extremely frustrating and couldn't sell that thing fast enough after it got back very close to the, the par value. So you had all that sell pressure coming out of GBTC. You had, uh, you, you know, there were inflows to all the other ETFs, which were gobbling up and buying a lot of that. But that offset of them already having purchased their seed uh, amount is the reason why the the buying did not match the amount of selling coming out of GBTC here for the first uh, couple of days. It seems like maybe it's starting to uh, level out and, and maybe uh, that sell pressure has subsided and uh, maybe we might start to see it run a little bit here. Uh, but I don't, I don't know. I, I don't, uh, the day-to-day -day price action to me is like trying to like solve quantum mechanics, like mm -hmm. good luck. Um, but I think that I think that example is very important because when we look to like Newtonian physics and we compare that in contrast to quantum mechanics, the one is like all over the place, really hard to to really kind of wrap your head around. And the other is like, yes, I suspect that this planet will be in this exact location at this point into the future. And you're dealing with much broader uh uh, movements that are somewhat predictable, who knows whether that's going to continue to be the case moving forward. But, you know, you put any type of Bitcoin price chart into long terms on the Y axis. And I was interesting. Some people are putting it even into the X axis in long terms, and you're getting really linear results. Um, it seems to be, uh, somewhat predictable in, in the oddest sense that I've ever seen in financial markets, truly the oddest sense I've ever seen in financial markets. Well, so what do you think will give Bitcoin that rocket fuel for the next real bull run where we exceed the last all time high? Um, do you think yeah. the halving will be a part of it? And I want to bring up this chart actually, because it's amazing what Bitcoin has done over the last decade. And here we have the top 10 assets, obviously gold still, market cap, 13 trillion. We've got massive companies, some of them in the Magnificent Seven. Mm -hmm. And Bitcoin is in the top 10. It's just yeah. 15 years old and it has ascended to being a top asset class. But yet we haven't, I, I think, I don't know, enjoyed some of the some of the price increases that we thought we might see by now. Um, so what do you think is going to lead to that next bull run? How insane is it that Vanguard and, and maybe a couple others, but Vanguard in particular is not letting customers mm -hmm. have access to Bitcoin as it's a top 10 asset in on the planet. Exactly. This is insane to me. This would, it's the equivalent of Vanguard saying, you know what? We don't think you should be able to buy Facebook or we don't think you should be able to buy right. Amazon. It's in the same lig as, as these other assets, right? right? They, they have that much hubris that they are telling their clients, nah, you know what? We know better than you do that. We're not going to give you access to this top 10 asset in the world right now. It's insane. <laughs> it's totally insane. And exactly. And, I hope it wrecks them because it's just absurd. Um, but to your point, uh, the question about like what's going to be the rocket fuel, what I think is lost on a lot is the rocket fuel has already been loaded into the Bitcoin uh, system and how it gets loaded into the system is through the hodlers of last resort that uh, just kept stacking more over the, over the past two years. So as the price is going down, these hodlers that are so convicted into Bitcoin just keep gobbling up more and more and more as that price went down to how low did we go? Like 15,000 or somewhere in that range, right? 
people you, you saw posts at those moments in time saying this is it this thing's dead literally the the european central bank came out and said this is it bitcoin's over mm -hmm. when it was around 15 16,000 or something like that but but that conviction and that continual stacking of bitcoin onto the balance sheet of of net producers, people that are actually earning money and creating value in society and exchanging that value that they created for these monetary units that they're then putting on their balance sheet to never come back on the market again. That is what makes it go up in these bull runs. It's, it's one of the two things that make it go up, okay? Because they're sucking that supply out of the system and it's it's very different from gold, where once the price starts to run, they just they flood the market with as much gold as they can put into the into the market. And there's no difficulty adjustment that's preventing that flow or tightening that flow of of monetary units in gold uh, hitting the market. That in Bitcoin it's very different. And for for Bitcoiners that have done the homework and have figured this out, they can't buy enough of this stuff with their retained earnings. And so that's the first part. That's that's the rocket fuel. The second part is uh, all the additional participants that are starting to see the the contrast of the decay of the fiat units in contrast to Bitcoin that are now showing up. And once that price starts to run, what happens is is a bunch of speculators step into the market. They might not be here for the long term value prop, but they but what they do is they recognize momentum. And so they come into the market because they're like, oh, like Bitcoin has everybody's attention because Bitcoin's up, what, 150% in the last year? That will get a speculator's uh, attention really fast, okay? Now, if it goes another 150 in, in the coming year, let me tell you, it really has their attention. And so what you're doing is you're attracting in uh, a set of investors that are, I, would, I don't even call them investors, they're speculators that get sucked into the, into the move. And then what happens to some of these speculators is they then become investors because they figure out what they actually own. Because the whole time that it's going up in these crazy runs, they're, they're saying, what is this? What is this thing? And um, curiosity can sometimes, especially, and there's nothing more curious than Bitcoin. There really isn't on the planet. Yeah. Like, how can this thing... That is this imaginary made up nothing unit. At least that's how the speculator would see it is that there's nothing behind this. Why did these people keep on buying this thing? I'm making so much money speculatively, like owning this for the next six months. Like this is crazy. What is it? And then they start doing homework and then they start learning that it's not just some, you know, made up Mario coin on the internet and that there's like encrypted energy like yeah. that's securing this thing and it's distributed all over the planet and all the stuff that, that we talk about all the time. That's what happens to the speculators. And if you keep 20, 30% of those speculators that came in just for price action, this yeah. is what sets the next floor of, of people in the next bear market that don't leave. Um, it's yeah. super interesting too, because, you know, to our earlier point about Jamie Dimon, there are some, there are some very smart or successful people out there who still don't understand that Bitcoin is the one you want to be focused on. And they go off and they say, no, it's blockchain. That is the innovation and smart contracts on top of it. And we saw that actually recently with Franklin Templeton, right? They came oh. out, they made some cool posts about Bitcoin and got the laser eyes and that uh, meme where it was the 60, 40 portfolio veering to the right, adding Bitcoin. And then all of a sudden it was like, Psh, blockchain is the innovation. And I'm more like, oh man, you were so close. What's happening? <laughs> I want to, I want to stomp this term. Like, Okay. People throw around the term blockchain all the time. And I'm convinced that they're doing it for one of two reasons. The first reason is they just don't even know what they're talking about. Okay. That's why they're applying this term blockchain to everything. The second is much more uh, sinister in that they're using blockchain as a marketing mechanism to sell some type of garbage that, that uh, is a rug pull. Um, so what do I mean by this? So going back to what I said when we were talking about the ego death capital and you're talking about security and uh, not optimizing for scalability, but optimizing for decentralization and security with the trilemma. Okay. 
a real blockchain, in my humble opinion, has to have those two things or else it's just some type of ledger that can be manipulated by an outside party. And if, and if that can happen, why aren't you use, just using a database, right? Why aren't you using a database? Um, you know, there's a lot of talk right now, and, and maybe we talk about this next, if, if you have an interest in it, uh, Natalie, is the tokenization of securities. Yes. And when we talk about that, we are talking about ledgers that inherently have uh, outside parties that are managing these ledgers. Is that something that you can do in an actual decentralized way without tying stock certificates back to corporations, which are tied to states that allow them to issue these stocks? Right. Right. And, and I'm not convinced that that is necessarily solved or solvable. Uh, the, the, the jury's out for me. I'm not saying one way or the other, but there's, there's things there that I think are, um, very suspect of whether you can do that uh, in a trustless, going back to the word trust, trustless kind of way. Um, when I look at doing this on uh, Solana, right? Uh, you know, you can have an opinion. Is this a three-letter agency coin that, I mean, it's FTX. This is, this is literally FTX's protocol that evidently went bankrupt or whatever it is, whatever status that it's emerging as because the Solana coin is bidding and the protocol is bidding. But guess what? It's optimized for scalability on layer one. Mm -hmm. So that means it's, it's either not optimized for security or decentralization, mm -hmm. which means it has a vulnerability, which means there's somebody in there that can pull the strings on security or, or decentralization, which means... Right you're building on quicksand. Yep. So if you're issuing, and I guess this is where I'm a little frustrated uh, with Larry Fink coming out and saying, oh, we're going to tokenize everything. Tokenize. Well, yeah. what, uh, what protocol are you going to do that on? Um, there's tons of hope that you can potentially do some of this stuff on Bitcoin with the Taproot Asset Protocol or, mm -hmm. or whatever, but it, it doesn't it doesn't negate the concern that I have as far as the the stock certificates being still tied to the SEC, which are tied to the states that are issuing the stock. Uh, today, just as a little bit of background, today, the way that this, this works is through the depository trust company, the D DTC. They're the ones that, that literally hold the ledger of all stock certificates. Mm -hmm. And if uh, BlackRock sends you know 100 shares of Apple over to Goldman Sachs, it goes through DTC to to relist that on their ledger that those that hundred shares were moved from from one to the other, right? That's a centralized ledger. That's yep. a digital ledger. The, yep. the clearing on this today is T plus two, okay? And people might be familiar with these terms with the ETFs because the ETFs are T plus one. But stock certificates on DTC are T plus two, and um, so. Are they, is DTC going to suddenly step out of the way and say, oh yeah, we're going to do this all on top of Ethereum or Solana? Like, I don't know. I just, uh, I don't, I think that this is, this is, uh, if I had to guess, and this might sound very tinfoily hat to people, I think this is uh, dis distractive uh, interviews on CNBC. So people look over here as they continue to stack as much Bitcoin as they can onto their balance sheet, my personal opinion. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, maybe I'm maybe I'm uh, maybe I'm thinking they're way smarter than they are. Well, just to know. put just to put a bow on all of this because I do I want to pivot to macro in a second. But for those watching, you're you're brilliant in the way that you explain things, Preston. Can you kind of simplify when when people start to hear this word? tokenization mm -hmm. and these massive asset managers and bank CEOs being very for tokenization. When yeah. if you're researching this space and you're starting to understand Bitcoin, you know that a blockchain is an inefficient database and it's a lot mm -hmm. more economical to just centralize and have a, a regular database. Can you just, can you simplify it? What, is, what are they referring to when they say tokenization and why yeah. does it not work? Well, I'm not, I'm, I'm not saying that it doesn't work. I'm just really suspect of okay. how this is going to play out uh, moving forward. So when they're saying tokenization, what they're talking about is immediate clearance. That's, okay. that's what the, the end state of what they would 
these they would want to achieve. And when you think about tokenization, because if it, let's say you're using Taproot Asset Protocol, which is built on top of Bitcoin, which is optimized for security and decentralization, which makes it long-term uh, secure as far as I'm concerned, right? If you're talking about using that, if I would send you a, a certificate of Apple stock, I'm sorry, I didn't turn this off on before I started with the thumbs up. Um, if I sent you a, a certificate of Apple stock, one Apple, uh, one one certificate of, of Apple stock, you would receive that effectively immediately. It would clear immediately that you would have the ownership. Today, using the depository trust company, you would get, you would officially have it in your custody and you really wouldn't have it in your custody. They would still be holding it on your behalf and you'd have some piece of paper saying that, that it's yours, which okay. is interesting in and of itself, right? Um, so they're saying into, putting it on a blockchain sends it faster and it settles immediately. Yeah. So it is similar to, to Bitcoin or uh, similar to lightning, I would say, where when I send you sats, like you see it hit your account and you have custody of it. If you can pull, if, if, if you go to layer one and you, uh, pull it off, you know, layer two, you have physical custody of that at that moment in time. Right. Okay. So for them, they're saying, well, we want to tokenize equity, which means now we can settle equity certificates instantaneously without some type of clearinghouse like DTC. And, um, the desire for this is also understandable. So when we when we look at how fast Bitcoin clears, what this presents to the balance sheet of banks and other institutions is if this thing clears really fast and you have other things that don't clear as fast, you can have holes in your balance sheet just from clearance alone. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so if the money is moving at this pace, which is 10 minutes every block, uh, is, is really kind of the frequency at which clearance is happening now with this new you know, system that's been constructed. And the legacy system is T plus two mm -hmm. uh, for equity and uh, currencies gotten a lot faster with their Fed now and, and they're trying to keep pace. But um, that presents uh, risk massive amounts of risk on balance sheets for well, who owns it right now at this moment in time. And can I be rug pulled if uh, I'm friends with somebody at DTC or wherever? And that's the concern. And, uh, and I think it's a very valid concern. I think it's something okay. that will need to be addressed uh, moving forward. I'm, I'm very suspect on the speed and pace that like real equity will, will be tokenized, like very mm -hmm. suspect on what that timeline is. Um, but, uh, the fact that they're talking about it tells me that they, that they really are starting to wrap their head around, uh, the direction that the world is moving. Now, the reason I think that Bitcoin is such a curse word for Jamie Dimon is I think that he really does understand how profound and important it is as, as the bedrock and new settlement layer. And, um, yeah. And, and if it is, it, it has massive ramifications for traditional banking, massive yeah. as, as we well know. It's time for another quick break to hear these messages from my partners. Next up, Bitcoin 2024, the world's largest Bitcoin conference is coming to Nashville this year. Come join us for three amazing days of keynotes, panels, networking events, and my Women of Bitcoin brunch. The Bitcoin conference is where I launched my podcast almost three years ago. You never know what can happen or who you can meet here. Head to b.tc slash conference and use the code HODL, H-O-D-L, for 10% off. Next up, CoinKite, which makes everything you need to safely self-custody your Bitcoin, including the cold card wallet. This is the cold storage device I use for safekeeping my Bitcoin. You can verify the source code, it's ultra secure, and it's easy to use even if you're a beginner. Head to their site in my show notes and get a 5% discount with promo code COINSTORIES. Next up, crowd health. Health insurance costs are sky high, and it's money that feels wasted if you don't need a doctor. By crowdfunding healthcare with other Bitcoiners, I get to avoid traditional insurance fees and support real people instead of mega corporations. Crowd health also works to reduce your medical bills, so the community's contributions cover more. Imagine spending just $100 a month on healthcare and investing the rest in Bitcoin. If you're interested, visit joincrowdhealth.com slash Natalie. All right, back to the show. Yeah, you know, this is it's really interesting because we're hearing these buzzwords and we're seeing um, folks on on massive uh, platforms kind of latch on and talk about how this is the real innovation and they want to they want to build their uh, system around it. 
But yeah, it makes you question what will you be able to trust? Because at the end of the day, all of these firms or companies will be issuers. That makes it a mm -hmm. security. And there's mm -hmm. inherently counterparty risk. And Bitcoin mm -hmm. is so different. I hope more and more can be built on Bitcoin. But I guess we'll have to see um, in well, the future what. One of the things that I'm really excited about with Layer 2 and the, the capability that it brings is you would think that on a long enough timeline, what's going to win in, if there is tokenization of, of equity? Mm -hmm. It's going to be something that moves the fastest, that has the lowest fee, and something that's actually secure and decentralized at the base layer. Mm -hmm. That should win, right? Like you yep. would think that that's what a customer would actually want. Um, and uh, you know, I think that I think the Taproot Asset Protocol that Lightning Labs came out with is something that truly addresses that and and accomplishes those three things that I just named versus all these other protocols that we've been hearing about for years that that uh, supposedly was the new tech and Bitcoin was boomer coin and mm -hmm. like all these things that people said in the last cycle. Um, there's been a lot of builders and a lot of engineering that we have seen at Ego Death Capital that uh, I think is um, suggesting that a lot of those narratives that were chirped on the last cycle are just blatantly false. And I am very excited about what's being built right now. Great points. And uh, for those of you watching who want to learn more about the the trilemma, the blockchain trilemma that Preston was talking about, read Jeff Booth's piece, Finding Signal in a Noisy World. I always want to refer people. I'll link it in the show notes because it's a fantastic piece to help you understand why it's so important to optimize for security and decentralization as opposed to scalability. All right, let's turn to the big macro picture. I recently had Lynn Alden on, and one mm -hmm. of the things we focused on was liquidity. Liquidity is mm -hmm. rising globally, yet... Mm -hmm. um, economies around the world are decelerating. I would love to hear mm -hmm. what your thoughts on what's happening with China's stock market right now and the implications mm -hmm. here. But let's start here in the in the US because so many people thought we would hit a hard landing by now. Mm -hmm. Some some are saying we're not going to have any landing at all. Um, fiscal dominance is a term I'm hearing thrown around a lot because we're still spending, 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 and our interest expenses are through the roof. So what's the big picture, Preston? Oh my goodness. So... Um... When we look at this, it's it, Lynn's right. It's all about liquidity. It's all about how many of these fiat units they're pumping into the system. And when we look at uh, what is quote unquote money, as you know, debt makes up an enormous part of that. And as debt becomes impaired, it starts to contract. And then the central bankers have to offset that with more monetary fiat units being added into the system in order to offset that. So, uh, you know, when we when we look at where we're at in the cycle, historically, over the last 40 years, the way that these things play out is once we start to see the the yield curve, the bond yield curve uninvert itself, typically you're you're in for a painful year and a half to two years in equities uh from this point forward is typically what you would see. I'm not so convinced that that's what we're gonna see this time around. Um this is the perfect Perfect chart to illustrate what I'm talking about here. So on the top, you have uh, the the yield curve, uh, and I'm just comparing the three month to the 30 year. And I think Dylan LeClaire actually came up with this chart just to kind of give him credit for piecing this together because it is really well done. Okay. Um, so focus on that top chart there. The, the line, the horizontal line that's going through there is at 0%. And so when it's at 0%, when the chart is, uh, when you see the, the green line at the 0%, what that's really saying is that the three month yield is giving you the same yield as a 30 year bond is giving you, which is crazy when you think crazy, about it. Crazy, yeah. Crazy. When it's really high up there, that's, that's a positively sloped yield curve. And that means that the 30 year is, is yielding, you know, as you can see on the chart, as, as high as like four to 5% above the three month, which is, what you would normally expect uh, the difference between short uh, duration money and long or short duration debt and long duration debt. Mm -hmm. What we're, what you're seeing right now is that it's, it's deeply inverted. It, the three month is giving you a 1%, a hundred bips higher than the 30 year right now, which is nuts. <laughs> when you think about just 
oh yeah, hey, I want to borrow money for for thirty years versus uh, one month from now, and and you're going to get paid way more for the the, the three month money. That's just or, crazy. Or debt. That's crazy. So when you look down on the chart there, look down on the S and P five hundred when you were deeply inverted like we are now on the S and P five hundred, and then look at the performance that came over the next two years after the, the yield curve started to uninvert itself, meaning that the 30 year started to give you a lot more yield than the short duration money. And what happens when it, when it moves out of this state over the next year to two years is typically the equity markets, the S and P 500 being represented in the bottom there really has a difficult time. And this is, this is going through a recession. So a lot of people in in markets today are, I, I suspect thinking that this is going to be just like those previous periods of time. I'm not so convinced. <laughs> and, uh, that is a very contrarian thing to say here. And I might be dead wrong. In fact, the, the, it's probably more likely that I'm going to be wrong than right, but I can't ignore the fact that I think fixed income is in a very, very bad place moving forward. And if true, all of that buying power that could potentially, and I'm strongly suggesting this is a potential that is potentially being sold out of fixed income, I think it has to go somewhere. And the only place that I know it can go is into equity. And mm -hmm. so I think you have uh, maybe even a melt up in equity. I was equities. just about to say, yeah, I yes. was just about to use that. So you predict maybe a melt up. Maybe. Yeah. And, and I think most will disagree with me and, and maybe they're, maybe they're way smarter on this than I am. I just think that, that we've, we are going through a very, very different scenario than we have for the last 40 years. And I think that we're going through this because, uh, there actually is, uh, an opportunity to move out of dollars and euros and yen and into Bitcoin and there's salvation there. And I think there's also salvation in, in equity that isn't uh, equity that is, that is free cash flow positive, that doesn't have to debase shares to stay alive. Those, that type of equity, I think, is going to do really well. Now, equity that, and so when we're looking at the indexes, that's what, that's what I'm referring to. And I think that that's a really important point that if when I'm saying that there's a melt up, there's a melt up in high quality equity that's actually generating free cash flows. Okay. Equity that is not generating free cash flows, which there's a ton of them are going mm -hmm. to do really bad. But these indices are, are dominated, absolutely yeah. dominated by companies that actually make profits. And they're going to do, I think they're going to do well through this. So S and P uh, five hundred, Nasdaq, Dow Jones, um, the yes. Mag Magnificent Seven. I mean, it yes. seems like them especially. Yes. Yeah, I mean, it's it's wild to see how much appreciation has just concentrated in those stocks as opposed to everything else. And I've I've read books like The Psychology of Money, and it's really fascinating to learn how few companies actually make up the majority of the gains for for the stock market. And you could go back mm -hmm. decades. So yes. if you can pick the right winners, um, you can make a tremendous amount of wealth. And the ind indices, it's it's interesting to uh, learn about how how much they've appreciated each year annualized compared to the M2 supply, because basically mm -hmm. you're tracking inflation, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. The, um, I see you brought up this M2. This is, yeah. this is global M2. So when we talk about liquidity in the system, I think that this is just, and, and this is, these are monthly bars. Uh, so they're, this is over a very long time horizon. Mm -hmm. And, and the Y axis on this is in log terms, but I think it's important to look at global M2 and not just M2 in the U S or M2 uh -huh. in Europe, because, uh, clearly central banking is completely coordinated around the world. Uh, yeah. if one is, if one is adding a lot of M2 into their system, I think you'll, you'll often find that it's, it's being offset a little bit in some of the other major economies where they're maybe not adding as much M2 into their uh, economy. Um, and so for the last two years, I think at this point, we've heard about this quantitative tightening and how they're tightening the money supply. And uh, when we look at, when we look at this chart, what I find fascinating is we're down slightly from the high but boy, is it hardly anything, right? Like yeah. at, on a global level of M2. 
it is it is practically nothing. And so for decade for more than a decade, you can see what the trend line is suggesting. This is this is pretty clear. Uh, we're grinding on the lower bound of that uh, trend line. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think once you kind of and, and isn't it neat that you kind of see the volatility of them basically really trying to tighten. I think once it, the the volatility kind of pans out on that bottom line, that's when you're either going to break something or right. we're going to see just a, a, a really substantial pivot uh, in the uh, in the, the the policy. And right now you're hearing you know, a lot of talking heads say that that's maybe the May, uh, June timeframe that you're going to see them sw- swiftly move into quantitative easing. And, uh, and, and I think that this is the one other point, if they're able to do this without breaking something, which is a massive, if, um, then you might see them continue to just kind of grind on that lower bound globally on the M2 liquidity. If they break something like really catastrophically break something or there's some outside event call it the red sea uh Mm -hmm. scenario that's kind of playing out right now uh over in in israel or ukraine or whatever um a a really big seismic event could could cause another big giant liquidity uh influx like we saw through COVID, and that would be very stimulus uh tons of stimulus for bitcoin for sure Uh, and i think it would be for high quality equities as well Yeah, I want to dig into a little bit of that because the geopolitics adding to the volatility is something I'd I'd love for you to weigh in on. It's been Mm -hmm. fascinating to see sort of um, Chair Powell try to remain, you know, higher for longer and tight, but jockeying a little bit with uh, Janet Yellen, who Mm -hmm. at at times really needs to come in and weaken the dollar and and taper over when there is potentially going to be treasury dysfunction. Mm -hmm. And so um, I agree with what Luke Groman has said on many shows that the shadow mandate of the Fed is basically to just make sure that there there's no there's no credit um credit crisis happening with the treasury yes. so so what's happening when we start to zoom out because you're right i mean we now have two wars um everything that's been happening in the red sea is kind of a little bit over my head and and the implications mm-hmm. for the global economy so what can you share about that so uh i love this question so on on the first front luke roman's point about the the, the thing that they care about is the treasury market he is yeah. absolutely right this is the the bedrock of the legacy system is functioning liquid treasuries um we're starting to see seismic shifts in the breaking of this bedrock with mm-hmm. the volatility and the fits that are being thrown the silicon valley bank was an amazing or not amazing, but a great example of the the seismic shifts and breakage that's happening inside of that digital monetary bedrock. The other component that goes hand in hand with this is the physical bedrock. Okay. What do I mean by that? This is, this is the free flow of commodities all around the planet through transportation means, whether it's rail, whether it's shipping, uh, and as people know, shipping makes up an enormous part of the physical movement of of commerce around okay. the world because of the flow of commodities. Mm-hmm. And so when we look at what's happening in the Ukraine, isn't it interesting that w- that's what we're talking about here is the flow of physical materials flowing from a net producing uh, nation to, to Europe, which is a net consumption mm-hmm. uh, you know, conglomerate of, of nations. And, um, so that's, that, that would be Ukraine. Then we, we see the disruption that's happening in Israel and Palestine. And, and so now what's happening in the Red Sea is there's the, the Houthi that are, uh, controlled through Iran uh, are backed by Iran financially. They are looking at these, these, uh, physical rails that connect the world that are transporting physical materials and commodities. And they're saying, we're going to disrupt that very akin to what's happening in, on the treasury markets, uh, you know, globally in the financial rails, which we normally talk about on the physical side, this is, this is a parallel, complete parallel to that. So when we look at what's happening, uh, the, the Gulf of Aden, which is just South of Saudi Arabia, where all this traffic is flowing through and then up into the Suez canal, 90% of the traffic since probably November is, is gone. 
90%. When we look at the rates that uh, were being paid to, to transport goods through this area, these rates have quintupled. Uh, when we look at how the U.S. Uh, and their, uh, their allies are handling this over there, there's been movement of, of very strategic ships that have actually been moved away from this area. There's some, there's many that have gone in, but there's some that have been moved out. Um, I would, I would, uh, I would equate this to a queen on the chessboard. Mm -hmm. The queen on the chessboard is, is, is a really interesting, uh, dichotomy. It's the most powerful piece on the board and you can do like just amazing things with it. But the other thing is, is you have to protect it at all costs. Yeah. Because if you lose it, you're pretty much going to lose the game. Right. Right. And so when I look at what's been done over there from a naval standpoint, them moving certain ships the way that they've been moving it, it's, it's very akin to like moving the queen on the chessboard. And, and some of it has been pretty defensive because they don't want to lose that. And they don't want the, the narrative to, to go out that like one of these very strategic ships have been hit and for obvious reasons. And I think that, you know, some of the parallels between such a simple game as chess and, and what we're seeing play out is just mm-hmm. kind of wild right now. Um, but yeah, those are some of my thoughts on this. And I think that when we, when we look at uh, inflation, so going back to uh, everything that's playing out economically, um, the reason that you're starting to see the, the bond yield curve uh, uninvert itself, I wouldn't officially say it has uninverted at this point, but it's really looking like it's about to. Uh, some of that is, is based on the expectation that inflation is now under control, mm-hmm. right? But when we look at what's happening in the Red Sea and the dysfunction in physical materials and how they're moving around, that is something that would, would be very contra to that narrative that inflation is actually under control. And so this is something we obviously have to watch very closely. Um, if this would spiral out of control and, and lead into other things, uh, it only makes their need to, uh, to do that aggressive M2 liquidity blowout that much more probable. But right now, I I mean, I don't know. It's just kind of like the framing of the array of things that could happen in the coming year. Well, usually when it uninverts, that precedes a recession, right? But it seems like we're nowhere really close to a recession in in terms of liquidity because they keep pumping more money in, at least on on the fiscal side. So I I just don't understand how this is going to play out, I guess. Well, I think that I think as you get closer to... uh, because this is all this is all managed. Uh, none of this is free and open market type right. things, right? So, like, this is completely managed. And the, and the issue that you get into is the harmonic. So, if if what's naturally occurring is that we're supposed to be going into a, a down wave, right? And then you're pumping massive amounts of liquidity in there because of these social disturbances that are happening around the world because the system is breaking down. Uh You get into this odd scenario where you're actually exaggerating the moves, the frequency of the moves Mm. with much more magnitude. Instead of like the noise canceling Bose headphones, you're doing the opposite. People have to take the things off because the, the noise is so loud. And I think that that's kind of what's in jeopardy here the way I would describe it into the coming year is I think that that, uh, that, uh, scenario where they're, they're going to literally really break something bad is just becoming more probable. I'm not saying it's going to happen. I think it's just more probable because of the total mismanagement and the breakdown mm-hmm. of incentives of this legacy system. Yeah. It makes me think of your analogy about the contractions and how they get closer and closer together and more and more aggressive yes. before the baby comes. Um, it's resonant seen- frequency. It's a, it's a, I'm sorry. I'm not using the correct term for this. This is called resonant frequency. It was when you're applying additional uh, frequency into what is already a harmonic that's occurring is you can blow out into a resonant frequency. The, the bridge uh, video that people are very familiar. That's a resonant frequency type scenario. Yeah. Have you seen Vegas vacation? Uh, I think I did many years ago. Yes. When a long time. There's ago. a scene where Chevy chase is like, he made the, he, he touched the wall of the Hoover dam and it started spilling <laughs> out water yeah, yeah, yeah. and he has to like put bubble gum in there to try to Try to yes, hold that's where we're at. Water back, and I feel like yes. that's exactly what the government is doing right now. <laughs> All I, right, I um, think you're right. I think you're right. Do you have a little bit more time to just cover a few more topics? Sure. Yeah, let's do it. 
Well, let's talk a little bit about um, real estate because commercial mm. real estate I know is facing uh, a lot more headwinds. There's, it feels mm -hmm. like there's like a vacancy and these these buildings that were once worth tens of millions of dollars basically on short sale. Um, but also I want to hear about residential real estate because I think a lot of people were hoping that prices would come down so that they, they can maybe enter the market and things are still really tough, especially with these high mortgage rates that exacerbate uh, the monthly cost of homes. Homes are just getting cheaper in Bitcoin, like you talked about in one of your recent shows. So can you give us a lay of the land when it comes to real estate, both residential and commercial? Yeah, I, I would start off with the commercial real estate. So some of the prices that we're seeing that these are being marked down at are uh, <laughs> like indescribable. Yeah. 70, 80, 90% markdown from where they were previously priced. Mm -hmm. uh, when we think about treasuries and we think about just bonds in general, what is behind a majority of that paper? And what's behind it are physical things. Real estate is a massive portion of that. So there's real things behind these, these paper instruments. And um, when we think about the utility of a lot of these paper instruments, um, like the underlying physical things that are behind them, they are grossly being mispriced. And they're being mispriced because they were priced as if inflation was always going to be nothing percent for years to come. And that's the fool's errand. It sucks you in. You're like, oh, well, it's only this much percent. I can just borrow like forever at these at these prices until you have to offload the property because of impairment somewhere else on your balance sheet. And when that happens, now you're now you become a forced seller, and you become a forced seller with interest rates at seven, eight percent, or whatever they they are. And you had an underlying assumption that when you bought it, they were going to be zero to two percent forever. And let me tell you, that's one hell of a reckoning that's happening right now. And uh, it just continues to put more and more pressure. Uh, it puts more and more pressure for adding M2 liquidity into the system because of all that impairment. When I say the word impairment uh, previously, this is what I'm talking about, is the impairment of these assets of where they were marked on their books versus where they're, they're at in reality once interest rates change. So that's, that's, a, that's a really important part. And, and it carries over into commercial or it, it carries over into residential real estate. Um, but it's, it's, uh, it's a lot harder to see, uh, interest rates raising will adjust prices. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, for people that are, you know, young millennials or people that are looking to buy a home, like the, the best advice I can give you is you want, you do not want to put much down on these homes. You want to put down, especially if the expectation is, is that interest rates will continue to, to go higher in the coming 10 to 20 years. And so that's my personal opinion is that we are going to see interest rates continue to just really struggle uh, higher and higher uh, for uh, homeowners. And um, so there's never a good time, quote unquote, good time. If interest rates are going higher, the good time is, is probably when inflation is at 2%, like they're saying it is right now. Um, those are kind of your best opportunities. Maybe this in the coming year to two years is probably the best, uh, maybe the best pricing that you might get. And, uh, so you just want to put down as little as you can on the house. You want to, you want to make those payments and you want hopefully for inflation to do its thing against the, the yield that you are able to lock in on that house. Um, but so much of that, so much of that recommendation comes down to whether my core thesis of inflation going higher in the next 10 to 20 years is correct. And people need to understand that and they need to make their own assumptions and, and, you know, expectations on what that is. I loved what you said on that, on that show recently, looking at a home in your area, how much it has gone up in quote unquote value since mm -hmm. like the pandemic and mm -hmm. now the monthly payments on it. And you know, mm -hmm. it really is pricing a lot of people out of this market. Oh yeah. It's crazy. I saw on the news the other day that the average home buyer today is like 50 years old. I mean, young people mm -hmm. cannot buy a house because how can they afford the monthly payments with their incomes? Yes. It's crazy. It is crazy. And uh, in that example, I can't remember the exact numbers we were using because I had some notes there whenever I was talking it. But uh, it, in general, it was like if you have a five hundred thousand dollar house from twenty twenty at three percent, and you're now in twenty twenty four, and you're dealing with a seven or eight percent, uh, you know, your your payments on that house went up three point two x. Yeah, three times. 
Yeah. It's 3.2 times more expensive for you to make the payments on that house that, than it was just four years ago. And so that like, that's a really, really big deal. Um, and it's why everybody's being priced out. That is, that is, you know, a millennial or younger uh, out of the housing market, which is really sad. And it's a, it's a reason why you have so much social unrest. It's why everybody looking yeah. at Davos and saying, you do not understand reality yeah. people. You do not right. understand reality. Yeah. Right. And they're calling for a redistribution of wealth, but they don't realize mm -hmm. they're actually just asking for more government to come in yeah. and muck with the whole system. Yeah. Um, the one thing I guess I just still don't understand is there are so many analysts that are saying, you know, we're, we're getting to that point where they're going to have to initiate QE infinity, but mm -hmm. I, I am, am I incorrect to believe that that would mean lower interest rates? Well, so I would argue that QE infinity is already sort of here, um, but it's only here for the banks. It's not here for everyday people. And that's through the Silicon Valley bank yeah. blow up and the backstop facility that was put in place, which is a backstop for the, the real pricing of fixed income. Yeah, that's and, the bubble gum um, going into the wall. <laughs> that's right. It really is. So QE infinity is here for banks. They've already been a huge beneficiary of that. Um, and so are they going to shut down that backstop facility? Of course, they're not going to shut down the backstop facility. There's no way that it's accelerating. Yeah. The, the use of it is, has accelerated into these last couple months as they're supposedly going to shut it down. Yeah, yeah. right. Not going to happen. You're going to have consolidation of banking. Uh, they're, they're going to continue to provide all sorts of stimulus for banks to continue to be able to function and be that interface between central banks and everyday people. Um, and they're going to support them through and through because they can't, going to Luke Roman's point, have a dysfunction in credit markets. Um, your question, though, I, I think I missed your question there on the comment. Yeah, just I, I thought that QE would mean lower interest rates. So potentially you could get in and get, you know, a, a so, house yeah. at a lower level. Or yes. So in the past decade, QE has meant that uh, the treasury market gets bid, interest rates go lower and lower, yeah. right? But when does that, when, when is that not valid anymore? Well, it's, it's, it becomes invalid when you do this for such a prolonged period of time, this market intervention and, uh, manipulation, once you do it so much that you start breaking physical things, going back to our earlier conversation, right. Yeah. And the inflation print isn't 0%. Which is mm -hmm. pristine optimism. What that represents at a zero percent interest rate, or close to it, zerp, right? Mm -hmm. um, what that represents with inflation representing less than two percent in fiat terms is complete optimization and efficiency of all systems that are that are globally connected. Okay, is that what we've been seeing since basically the Ukraine Russia invasion? No, what we've opposite. actually been seeing is the opposite of that. Yeah. And what it appears is that is accelerating. This dysfunction in the physical exchange of goods is causing that. And, and what I would tell you is that physical stuff is upstream of the digital stuff. When mm -hmm. we're talking about treasuries and all this other stuff, that is downstream of physical reality of moving parts and pieces and materials and commodities and goods and services and all that. Yeah. Okay. So if, so a, a signpost for me is if we saw the world just miraculously started getting along and the flow of materials just started happening again, well, then maybe this core thesis that I've been talking about is wrong, but everything that I'm seeing is that, that it, that is not the case. It's the opposite is that it's accelerating the dysfunction and cooperation is becoming more dysfunctional, which tells me inflation is going to continue to come up, which also tells me more QE is going to make it more dysfunctional, which is opposite of what we saw from 2008 to 2020. This is fascinating and a little confusing. So basically you're, mm -hmm. you're forecasting higher inflation, like secular, mm -hmm. higher interest rates. Mm -hmm. But I mean, that will, that will break things. They can only do that for so long. Right. So would yeah. that initiate the opposite? No. I mean, I, well, you get to a, you get to a physical constraint, Natalie, you get to a physical constraint of what reality can handle through the manipulation. Yeah. Right. 
So you can do this QE, you can incentivize all this optimization and it will become mm-hmm. more optimized. Inflation is going to keep going down and you just, you're running at peak performance. But it, uh, I guess imagine taking, uh, here's an example. You got this, you got this athlete that you were doing all these things to manipulating their mm-hmm. body to, to perform at this very peak level. They can run faster than anybody in a hundred meter sprint. And you're like, I want more. I want them to even run faster. So you go out there with the same steroid you've been pumping them with uh, that was manipulating their, their ability to perform and you pump this steroid into them that takes them over their physical capacity to handle it on the next time that they run the hundred, hundred meter sprint, are they going to go faster? Nope. They've become dysfunctional. Yeah. And like, if, if there's a way I could somehow like really kind of general generalize quantitative easing and all these policies and what's mm-hmm. been done. These are stimulants to, yeah. to, to operate at peak performance, but they've, they've, they've gone too far. And now, now think about what's going to happen to this person as you put that steroid in them and the, the next race that they run, they're not going to be as good as the race before. And so the, the person that's pumping this stimulant into them is saying, all right, well, we, we need to double down on what we right. did last time, which is making this, this athlete more and more dysfunctional and to the point where they can't even get out of their bed to run the race. That's how dysfunctional they become. And I, and unfortunately I suspect for the legacy system, unfortunately, fortunately, I don't know which, which one you want to, you want to use. Right. I'm just trying to describe the reality as I see it. Right. Right. And luckily That's we have what, this parallel system, but it's degenerating. Exactly. The current one is degenerating and that athlete's about to collapse. So. That's right. You have somebody else that can run this race and boy, they're very promising. Even though they're 10 years old, they're already running nearly as fast as the other one. And, uh, you know, next year they're going to be running way faster than the other one with all the stimulants. So, um, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's a wild world. Yeah, it's a fascinating to see how how this is playing out. And we have enjoyed so much privilege for the longest time being the global reserve currency, but we see these tectonic shifts happening. And I I think I heard just last week that now 20% of oil deals have been made in non-US dollars. So, um, you know, all these swap lines are being opened up and, and other currencies are being used, but other countries don't, you know, no one wants to use the yuan necessarily as a global reserve currency. So what will fill that that role. Um, all right, before we start to wrap up, I did want to ask you for those listening to all of this and they're like, how do I play this out over the next 10 years? Uh, maybe some are 90% in Bitcoin and others want to diversify a little bit. I mean, how, how should people be allocated, especially if they do say, okay, I've, I've got this, I've got a, a, a good healthy amount of Bitcoin that I feel comfortable with. Um, but how do I, I look at investing outside of Bitcoin? What do you advise them? Yeah, I think that uh, the, the beauty is you can protect yourself from all of this, in my humble opinion, with very little Bitcoin today. Today. Really? Now, yeah, in four like years from now, or, or <laughs> I would say uh, 2%. Really? I think if, yeah, I think if you had a 2% position, whatever your current net worth is, it'll, it will protect that net worth today. If you had a 2% Bitcoin position, maybe even 1% position. Yeah. What um, if you so, have 50% or more? Well, then your whatever your net worth is, will probably be 50 times higher on the other side of this. Okay. <laughs> Just to kind of give you an idea. So like if your net worth is, uh, you know, a hundred thousand dollars and you're protecting that hundred thousand dollars with a one or 2% position, then I think that the hundred thousand dollars of buying power will be protected on the other side. Okay. If you have 50% Bitcoin, we'll just 50 X that number of okay. the, yeah. Wow. So, um, that's, but I don't say that because, because for a person to have a position size that large, they have to actually understand what they own. And this is not something very easy to wrap your head around. So I would caution that somebody who doesn't, who, who hears that and just, because for that person, not me, but for that person, it's a speculative investment at that point, because they haven't matched their intellectual knowledge of the position size that, that they're taking on, which means they may sell at the exact wrong time. They'll buy at the wrong time and then they'll sell at the wrong time, which means that it's a double whammy for that person. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that's important. Um, what else do you put into that portfolio though? Was, was really your question. Yeah. And, and, uh, going back to what I was saying earlier. So as this legacy system demonetizes itself and it flows into a new system, let's say you're just completely wrong about Bitcoin. 
What I don't think you'll be completely wrong about is that equities will uh, perform in in the legacy monetary units, uh, you know, in, in that legacy monetary unit. But uh, it's not going to even come close to the replacement monetary unit's performance. Um, but relative to that that high the the that equity that actually generates free cash flows, it's going to way outperform fixed income, massively outperform fixed income. Um, and so like, that's, that's what I would recommend is that you own high quality equity that has some type of competitive moat in any type of environmental setting that actually kicks off profits. Um, that's where I would focus, uh, the rest of whatever your buying power is. And I would just dollar cost average into it. It's going to be all over the place because as the fiat melts down, it's going to be throwing violent fits. Yeah. Going back to the athlete, that athlete would be f throwing violent fits as it's being pumped with these narcotics. Yep. Uh, that will be represented in the price of everything in fiat terms. It is going to be violent. Uh, so. Good advice. Yeah. All right. Last two questions to wrap up quickly. Elon Musk, I heard you kind of schooling him on proof of work. Any other, <laughs> any other messages? Like if you could sit down with Elon Musk, what would you say to him? Especially I, about Bitcoin. I, I said, uh, I was just, I asked a question, right? <laughs> um, I didn't make any statement or anything. I asked a question <laughs> and uh, he didn't like the question. And um, he doesn't want to talk about Bitcoin. Jamie Diamond doesn't want to talk about Bitcoin. We're the only ones that want to talk about Bitcoin. Let me, let me defend Elon. Okay. Let me try okay. to, let me try to paint the picture for, for people that are, um, hearing the exchange. So this guy is a hardcore engineer and builder. This guy, uh, wants, this guy is a master of the fiat legacy game, a master. Nobody played, played the game better than he did as far as mm. like what he was able to build under those circumstances. He is, he is hyper-focused on emerging and future technology as it relates to, uh, like doing real things of, uh, you know, building rockets or building cars or whatever. Okay. He has levered this, this green, uh, you know, I'm going to, and, and he was able to capture tons of government money in, in the mm, name of tons. those types of things. Yeah, yeah. Tons. All these subsidies. Yep. Yeah. What was really interesting about the exchange uh, uh, on the ARC uh, discussion on the spaces that I had with him, he said the reason that he sold Bitcoin off of his balance sheet at Tesla was working capital reasons. So what that means when he says that is we were managing our liquidity because we weren't as profitable as we would have liked to have been. And we had to sell the thing on our balance sheet that's to come up with, with liquidity to move forward operationally in our business. That's what, that's what wasn't said. So when, when he says working capital is the reason we sold it, that's the real reason he sold it. Then what I found just as interesting is over at SpaceX, he says, we still hold the same treasury that we had at SpaceX, right? Well, why? It's because he's making money over there and he doesn't have to sell the thing that requires you to be profitable to continue to retain it, which is mm -hmm. Bitcoin. If you don't make money, and I keep saying this over and over and over and over again, if you are not a net producer, which means I don't create profits for the world, you can't retain Bitcoin. It will leave your treasury. It has to. Okay. Mm -hmm. So when he said what he said that, oh yeah, we sold it for working capital reasons over at Tesla, but we didn't for SpaceX. I was like, okay, so one was profitable in that moment. And, and Tesla's, Tesla's making money, but it's extremely lumpy yeah. and it's, it's not real clean. And so that's why he has to sell it. Um, and boy, doesn't that tell you something, right? Now, uh, a little bit more like me, I guess, trying to defend Elon. Elon, if, if he's actually creating value through a business, okay, he knows that whatever the unit of account is that the world moves to, it will naturally flow to that equity, right? It will naturally go there. And he's just hyper-focused on creating and building things that he thinks that the world needs. And uh, whether you agree with that or not, that's a whole nother discussion. But he thinks that he's creating value, uh, things that are going to make the world a better place and more efficient and optimized. And 
and if he does do that, that equity will naturally attract whatever monetary unit you want to discuss. So when he says, I'm not interested about Bitcoin, but uh, he holds it on his balance sheets, right? Interesting. I think that that's more of what he's, uh, I think that's the lens that he views the world through. Hmm. Yeah, you know, I mean, he's getting all these payment licenses. So I hope whatever he does with X, turning it into more of a payment rail, like the WeChat, I think, in, of China, mm-hmm. I hope he incorporates Bitcoin more and more. Um, all right, fun he looks at it through. A, he looks at it through a fees standpoint. Like if sure. he can make more money on fees, then that's the, cho- that's the choice that he wants to make. Uh, True. But yeah, yeah. All right, fun question. If you could direct an ETF commercial, what would it be? <laughs> Well, I, I told Kathy uh, Wood my recommendation, which was the 2% allocation and the rest in cash over any four-year period had the same performance as the S&P 500, better than the S&P 500. Yeah, that was amazing. Um, that statistic that you brought up was incredible. For those that haven't heard it, can you just repeat it for them? Yeah. So uh, Bitcoin operates in four-year cycles for the most part. Uh, when you look at the peaks and the troughs, I don't think that it's ironic that, that they kind of correlate over any type of four-year period. Uh, because of the four-year halving cycle is what I think has driven it, at least in the past decade, whether that continues to be true in the future or not, I don't know. But um, if you literally pluck any four-year period you want out of the price action on Bitcoin, and you would have had 2% exposure in a portfolio that was made up of 98% cash, 2% Bitcoin, it would have outperformed the S&P 500 over any uh, over that same four-year period of time. Amazing. Uh, and you, you can pick the four-year period. And people that hear that are just like, there's no way. Well, go do the math. See, see what you see what you come up with. I think you'll find that it's it's pretty dang accurate. That's amazing. Um, I think that that's something that uh, people that are being good fiduciaries moving forward now that they have access to Bitcoin's mm-hmm. performance. Uh, yeah. I think that I think that you're uh, in breach of your fiduciary duties if you don't have some type of uh, exposure or at least understanding as to what it is and what it offers. Completely agree. If I would, was going to direct a commercial, I would yeah. hire Margot Robbie to do the bathtub scene from the big short, but explain Bitcoin. <laughs> 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 Got to get Barbie in there. There's so many opportunities. There's so many opportunities. <laughs> All right. Um, it's been such a pleasure, Preston. Again, congratulations on Thank GP you. at Ego Death Capital. So excited for you guys. Um, any final thoughts and last words you want to leave people with? Hey, this, we have every reason to be excited about the future. We really do. I know that, that the news and the social media stuff that can be out there, just mute these people. You do not have to, like, I know some of it is sensing your environment. And I know that that's why I follow some people that, that really have a negative slant on like what the future brings. But let me tell you, the way we change the world and the way we make it a, such a better place to live is it starts right here upstairs in your brain, right? You have to think positive. You have to think constructively about how you're going to build this new future. It's just not going to build itself. You have to think about how you can do that, how you can lever the, the various frequencies that are out there and use them to your advantage. I, I like to say the, the analogy of the boat, like just because you have a headwind, blowing in your face doesn't mean you can't move directly into that headwind. You can just tack into the wind, learn how to harness that energy and build the thing that makes everything better for everybody else. So we are here. We are blessed to be here. And, and Bitcoin is just uh, an amazing uh, human achievement that is somewhat indescribable. And I think it's going to usher in so much abundance for the world. And I am here for it. And I am super excited about 2024. Beautifully said. And we're blessed to have you in this space, Preston. Thank you so much. I will link all of your amazing work in the show notes. So please go follow Preston and uh, we'll see you in Madeira. Yeah, I can't wait. That's going to be exciting. Thank you, Natalie. Thank you. This show is also brought to you by iTrust Capital. iTrust lets you invest in Bitcoin for your retirement with the tax benefits of an IRA. If you're doing retirement planning and considering adding Bitcoin to your portfolio, you can sign up for an account and get a $100 bonus at itrust.capital slash Natalie Brunel. 
Thank you so much for checking out this episode of the Coin Stories podcast brought to you by BitDeer. Make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss out on any new content. This show is for educational and entertainment purposes only. Nothing should constitute as official investment advice, and you should always do your own research. My inbox is open if you want to share feedback or guest suggestions. You can reach me at natalie at talkingbitcoin.com. I'll see you next time.